And without much further ado, our next speaker is Noel Tok. He's a digital nomad. Most of you who have visited any other world can probably know of him or have even seen his talks. Today, he's going to talk about WordPress uh, in 2020, right? Not 2021. <laughs> and yeah, please applaud Noel Tok. Cool. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Can you guys hear me all right at the back of the room? Great, cool. So um, before we get talking about the, the future of WordPress and what we need to keep uh, an eye on for next year, uh, I think it's worth maybe going back a bit in time. Uh, I built my first website in 1995, uh, which is quite a while ago, but I only made the, the jump from hobby to professional much later on. Um, and WordPress was a really big contributor to that. Um, this was the WordPress.org website back in 2010. And even though I began with playing with WordPress around 2008, I'd say, uh, I think 2010 was the, the big year for me because um, that, was, that was the turning point when custom post types were introduced. And, and to me, that was like the future at that point. Because I wasn't interested in blogging, but I was interested in, wow, custom post types, I can do anything I want, um, which is really cool. So that feature probably had the single largest impact on, I don't know, my career in WordPress, maybe, back then, um, which is quite cool. Um, but you can see that the pitch back then was, WordPress is a state-of-the-art uh, publishing platform with a focus on aesthetics, web standards, and usability. Um, so the scope was also limited to blogging. It wasn't you know, necessarily about websites. If you look at the WordPress website today, it says, hey, this is for blogging, this is for websites, and even applications, uh, which is pretty crazy in, in terms of how broad this has all become. Um, and keep in mind, WordPress was already 11% of the web at the time. Now, I've dug this out of the archives. Uh, <laughs> this is my website at the time, almost 10 years ago. And thumb things will give away the age almost immediately. I think the, the green check marks with the gradient um, are a pretty dead giveaway of probably terrible design. Um, I'm showing this here. Uh, I didn't even realize this, this was a slider uh, till uh, like yesterday when I noticed the, the three circles at the top. Um, so great user experience there. Um, <laughs> the lighting and the shadow is, shadows and everything are all completely different. Um, I mean, all in all, I'm, I'm quite happy, but that wasn't the largest shock factor. I think the, the largest shock for me was the language, all right? And so I was looking at this and I used words like stunning uh, and look great, similar to how WordPress.org talks about uh, being aesthetic, right? There was this large focus on uh, the visual and that makes a lot of sense back then. SEO and, and marketing was quite easy. You know, like you'd, you'd publish a page, it would get ranked, you get traffic and everything was okay. A uh, bit different story uh, nowadays. And to me, um, that era, um, the goal was to, in, in many ways, was to exist, right? Um, it was to have a website online to go from zero to one. And so if the restaurant down the street um, had a, a website and the other restaurants around it did not have a website, it was winning. You know, that was kind of the name of the game back then. Um, so that was, that was very interesting at the time because there was no, no competition. So going online was both the process and the goal and the and, end and result in, in one. Um, and then we'll come back to this topic after. So today, as Martin already mentioned, uh, WordPress is uh, already 33% of the web. Oh, cool, thanks. Um, so WordPress is already 33% of the web. Um, and taken you know, at face value, that's an incredible number. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no CMS, other CMS or other tool or application with that kind of brand that even comes close. And looking, over that, looking at that journey over the past decade, you know, custom post types, um, thousands of plugins, an easy, easy theming engine which connects the back end to the front end, um, all helped to really fuel that, that growth, which we, we've seen. And that's why many of us are here today. We had this easy ability to just go online and produce something. Um, but, you know, like I'd argue that, um, that this 33% that we see today um, 
you know, it, it isn't just more of the same. It isn't just that, hey, there's more plugins, there's more themes, and we're going to more work camps. That's why the number went from 11 to 22 to 33%. I don't think that's the case at all, or rather that it's just not as simple as that. So to help us with that, I made a little chart. Um, and this chart shows us on the left side uh, the Google Trends data. Uh, I, I think most of you are familiar with Google Trends. It shows you interest for a particular topic. And that's, that's wide, uh, wide ranging interest. So in the case of Google, it's mostly search volume and how interested the, the population at large is. And we can see that, you know, a number 100 in this case is the most interest that WordPress would have ever gotten at a certain point in time. So if we look at, let's say, 2012, we can see that from then on, the market share has doubled. You know, so we've gone from 17 to 33%. But this, this consumer interest around this global brand called WordPress has halved, which is very interesting. Um, and I'd like to be able to, to, to dig, you know, quite a bit deeper in that today to help understand you know, how that's come to be and what that means for us going forward. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, the greater you know, web ecosystem that WordPress is a part of. Uh, when the goal, for, when, when a goal for, for a website was simply to exist, um, you, know, you, you used to be able to build an entire website in WordPress. That hasn't changed. You can still build an entire website in WordPress. It's just not as competitive as, as it used to be, right? Um, and, and that's because you know the the, the people uh, you might not be able to uh, engage people as frequently as, as you used to. Um, you might it might mean you're you're not able to discover new people to come to your website as you used to. Um, so you have to grow beyond WordPress and acquire other tools and be part of a larger ecosystem. And together, those various tools then form the new solution. And a great way of understanding this is by, I think, looking at some of the core features or main plugins that we used to use or sometimes still use today, but are slowly transitioning out to third-party solutions. Uh, so let's look at a few examples. Uh, search. Uh, who, who uses WordPress search on their website? Anybody? OK. A few of you. OK, cool. Um, Martin, I'm surprised. We'll have to talk about this later. <laughs> but search is one of these interesting things because if you have a small website and you have great content architecture, you don't really need to have search, right? There's 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 not a large point because otherwise you're you're trying to make up for a deficiency. If you have a very large website, you probably do need search. But the problem is that, or no no no, it's a good problem to have. But search nowadays. Um, the expectations from the consumer have become much, much larger, right? We've been using Google for I don't know how many years. All of us in this room, 99%, I'd assume, um, have been using Google to a certain extent. So we, expe we, we expect that kind of search experience to occur on large websites that we visit. We expect to be able to type in something like uh, electronic vehicle and then also see results for Tesla. We expect to be able to make a, a, a typo or a mistake uh, and for the search engine to automatically kind of assume what we're looking for. Um, we also assume that the website will make prioritized rankings and weightings based on what is generally most uh, looked after. And in that case, basic search from WordPress just doesn't really cut it in that regard anymore. You know, So a lot of people back in the day moved over to Elasticsearch when they had a, a larger website. And then from there, um, all the learnings that happened in an elastic search were, were then you know, productized in companies like Algolia, where you just connect your WordPress site and all of a sudden you have you know, a search, uh, which is, uh, I, I'd say, a lot smarter or intelligent than the default search. And search in that regard is not a core competency of WordPress. Another example is conversation, right? We have WordPress comments. Um, the comments have become a lot more elaborate um, than they used to be. And comments in some way are this, this extension of guest books. Did anybody ever have a guest book on their website? I did. Yeah, cool. It's like three people. Uh, <laughs> uh, we should bring guest books back. But conversation nowadays, um, uh, again, is hitting this wall because we have discuss, we have live fire, um, we have you know WordPress comments. 
and none of them are really being none of them are really able to to hit that that the next level of conversation and engagement you know um, i've been using discuss for a while but i'm i'm already sensing like where is this going you know um, i'm i'm happy that there's you know that there's there's automated moderation i'm i'm happy that um there's 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 new ways of uh commenting like inline commenting which might you know come to gutenberg to a certain extent um but a lot of these things generally don't belong inside of WordPress because they, again, need intelligent uh, systems around them in terms of uh, social logins, in terms of moderation, and things like that. Uh, another noteworthy one here is the Coral project, if I haven't mentioned it, from Mozilla. Analytics, uh, again, who had a, a dashboard inside their WordPress site that just showed how much traffic they were getting uh, day to day? Yeah, basically like all of you at, at some point, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and that was, that was analytics to us, you know, like number went up, good, number went down, bad. Uh, and that's, that's how simple analytics was. But this has become so much more complicated over time. It's just not that simple anymore. You can, have, you can receive little traffic from a, a great audience or a lot of buyers, which is very valuable, or you can get a lot of traffic from a lot of people who are not relevant. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to figure out through lots of different tools, what is the best way to do things. So we had a lot of analytics plugins inside of WordPress. These are kind of dying because they're being replaced with Google Analytics integrations. They're being replaced with uh, Hotjar, Decibel integrations, um, God knows what. Same with email. Um, you know, my first small business customers that I had in you know, 2010, 2011, I'd set up their newsletter inside of WordPress. It didn't mean that I was sending automatically blog posts every week or something like that that were being published. It was a separate newsletter tool inside WordPress. And if, if we're sending out to 1,000 or 2,000 people, the emails would send out every two or three seconds, right? Like it was on a cron job, just kind of running like that. And again, here we see that, um, you know, these kind of tools are, are, are living somewhere else now, like MailChimp, SendGrid, Campaign Monitor. Uh, because they're intelligent, because they have lots of data, because they're able to say, hey, you know, this person's in this geographic region bas uh, based on past behavior. They'll, they'll be online around these hours. So for that particular person, we'll send at that time. That's just not something that, you know, we can figure out for our own little site. So the growing ecosystem is, uh, ecosystem is, is an important one. And I think you, you're sort of understanding the, the point I'm trying to make uh, in that there's a lot of core features or larger plugins inside of WordPress that are now, you know, slowly moving outside of WordPress and becoming part of SaaS solutions or third-party solutions. Um, the nice thing about that for for the economy or, or, or for organizations, for clients, for businesses, for whoever, um, is that a lot of these solutions are very user-friendly, right? They're they're there for non-technical people, so a client doesn't have to come to you and say, hey. Uh, I need to send a newsletter or, uh, you know, I'd like to, 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 to tweak the, the search weightings or, or something like that. They, as a business power user, can go in and, log and do that themselves. Um, and last but not least, uh, we're seeing a lot of these different solutions really focus on actual business value. So if you look at the, a, a few of these examples, uh, Discuss says, express yourself. Uh, Hotjar says, the fast and visual way to understand your users. And MailChimp says, put your people front and center. None of them actually talk about the solution. They just talk about people. Um, you know, this is, this is the, the, the new game in terms of trying to focus on the actual outcomes as opposed to the technical implementations. So along with the replacement of these, these core features that we're seeing or these, you know, larger plugins that used to exist, um, we're also seeing, you know, the, the entrance or emergence of completely new technologies um, as if the, the web wasn't complicated enough. Uh, so technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, or the latest JavaScript framework, I'm sure like three new frameworks came out this morning that we haven't even heard of yet. Um, they're all very exciting. They're all here to stay, but they do come with a lot of uh, implementation challenges. And I wanted to... Well, I mean, this, this kind of sums up um, a, a lot of what we, we tend to see nowadays. Um, there, there's a lot of hype around things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, but at the end of the day, when it's actually implemented, it's a lot simpler. Uh, and it's a lot more, uh, I don't know, a, a lot more human in that regard. There's no big machine running around. 
Um, but nonetheless, there's a couple examples I wanted to run uh, through for you guys. Um, I guess all of you know Servus. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so we're the WordPress partner for uh, Red Bull Media House in Salzburg. Um, and they've now uh, gone with uh, Gutenberg across multiple properties. So how many of you have already started using Gutenberg? Yeah, very cool. That's great. Um, it, it's it's a daunting task, and it's it's really cool. But it's uh, yeah, it's really amazing. And you know, in, in cases like this with uh, Red Bull and Servos, like these are large organizations that are trying to do, they're trying to centralize things and are trying to think more in terms of blocks rather than pages, right? The concept of pages to a certain extent is even becoming outdated. That's the the kind of time we live in. Content lives in fragments and is then distributed through various channels. Uh, it's kind of a scary thought, but that's that's the new world we live in. Uh, and in this case, you know, Gutenberg is scaled across multiple different properties. Uh, so the same block can have different styling on different pages, but essentially we use the same custom block. Uh, another example is TechCrunch, which we help rebuild um, from scratch. So the TechCrunch that you see online today is completely headless, which means that it has WordPress on the back end and then uses React on the front end. How many people have used React or Vue or Angular? Okay, fair few. Wow, cool. Um, so you'll know, like, you know, this is, it's great technology. We talk about it a lot. You see it a lot in, in you know, web design news and conferences and things like that, but there's a lot of implementation challenges, you know? Like, I'm rebuilding my own personal website in React, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why, why I, I, I started down this path now, <laughs> because there's, there's not much value on, on a very personal level uh, to, to, to go down that path. But for large organizations, there certainly is. Uh, in the case of TechCrunch, um, there's, there's no more page switching. So you don't click on a link and then you know, have a blank page that, that loads up. You just seamlessly transition from one page into, uh, into the next. And for them, that's increased engagement by the upper sort of double digits in terms of percentage, which is uh, quite an impact for a business that has this much traffic. Um, and lastly, the last thing I wanted to talk about or the example I want to provide was uh, Siemens. Um, so we've, we've been working with Siemens. And in this case, um, we've ripped out Gutenberg from the back end uh, and we've put it on the front end. And then we've connected, connected it to a bunch of artificial intelligence uh, APIs, uh, which is quite fun. But that is really like the forefront, you know? And in a case like this, um, what it's doing is it's doing simple things like checking for grammatical mistakes and then making suggestions. Um, but it's also helping find uh, more SEO friendly synonyms. Uh, you know, so if you have something like digital city, it might say, hey, smarter city is a term that's more looked for. Maybe consider using this instead. Um, and even makes headline suggestions in that regard. So it's even engaging not only in natural language processing, but then also natural language generation. And this happens all the way to the hashtag recommendations uh, it makes based on trends that are happening more or less in real time. Uh, so in this case, you can see the, the header in the back, which is how can digitalization relieve pressure on cities? And the first hashtag recommendation is Expo 2020 Dubai, which is pretty much the, you know, a perfect fit in terms of hashtags to use. Um, and that's all coming from places such as Twitter, Medium.com, Reddit. Um, that's how the headlines are being generated or how the sample is, is being created. That's how data and topics are being brought together. Um, it's quite advanced, you know, and this is, this is a tool that, you know, for an industrial company or a, a history of being very industrial uh, is quite ambitious in, in that regard, you know, these, these sort of in initiatives. Um, so this is... The interesting thing about a lot of this, uh, and you know, before I talked about how some WordPress features are being replaced um, by third parties, but at the same time, we're also seeing, um, you know, this, this increase in what WordPress is truly known known for, which is content and, you know, publishing online. Like that's the focus. It's not necessarily having a search functionality. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, having uh, a templating engine necessarily. You know, publishing online. Um, and and the, the sort of core of actually creating content is probably the, 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 the biggest sort of focus point of WordPress, which is why Gutenberg is such a massive project, right? Gutenberg alone has had more commits 
in the last year than Drupal has as a whole project, which is crazy. Um, Gutenberg, in that, in that sense, is its own application. It's its own sort of project, and it's, it is very heavy because of the user experience that's required uh, to, to, to elevate something like that to a standard that helps um, all of us actually feel like it's a tool that we can put in front of users. Um, and technologies, in, in that regard, try to, you know, like it, it makes more sense to try and do one thing well as opposed to many things poorly. And WordPress was great in that regard 10 years ago. It was, you know, let's, let, let's try to do everything because none of these tools are available. So let's use all the plugins and create everything on WordPress. And now that a lot of these best ideas, these, these best sort of uh, lessons learned have come out and have been built into SaaS solutions, there's not necessarily a massive need for that to, to all occur inside of WordPress. So being able to, to be part of this, this larger ecosystem uh, is, is so important nowadays. Um, and it's, it, it is a real thing, you know, like I, for a lot of years, was more or less stuck inside this kind of WordPress bubble in terms of, hey, you know, like always use plugins, always do this and that. And at some point, you know, you, you realize, hey, to be able to compete, we really have to use the best of both worlds. Uh, and in all the cases I mentioned before, um, you know, in the case of Red Bull, it's, it's mixing uh, Gutenberg with Red Bull's incredible sort of video power, so their own APIs and, and, and their way of, of doing things and their technology behind that, that's proprietary. Uh, in the case of TechCrunch, that's mixing uh, WordPress with React. In the case of Siemens, that's mixing Gutenberg and AI. Uh, and by, by combining these different technologies, you often unlock these sort of new sources of value for businesses. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, like the implementation is a big challenge. So we might see a lot of hype around AI, machine learning, and all these things. But what you're seeing here um, is, is, you know, I'd say it's probably the forefront of, of these kind of projects, um, mostly because there's a big difference between what you can build as a proof of concept and, you know, as build in terms of theory and as a demo, uh, and what you can actually put into production for many, many users. So I feel like we've been talking a lot about, you know, fragmentation uh, and, and specialization in that regard, but it's also important to consider how our own roles uh, play into it. So 10 years ago, I, I feel like anybody could have been mildly successful um, if they just put the hours into being a web designer. It didn't really matter. You know, the skill didn't matter all too much. And I guess that's also because just getting a website out there was the, the, the biggest goal. Um, and I certainly, you know, describe myself back then as as a web designer. But you know, does anybody still describe themselves as a web designer today, in this room, on on their actual LinkedIn profile? No. <laughs> well, exactly. So that's a. I think mean, that's the part of the point. But you know, like I've, I certainly do some certain uh, sometimes meet people who you know still have the web designer title, and generally they they they're a sole proprietor. Uh, so they so they work alone. Uh, so they're uh, selfständig. Uh, they you know probably work with small to medium sized businesses. And lastly, they're they're probably coming at this more from the marketing angle than the uh, development angle. And this is also you know reflected when we again look at Google Trends. It's kind of crazy when you look at it now that web designer as a term has come all the way down to the point that it's matching in terms of popularity with UX designer. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, when you said UX designer, no one was ready to pay any money for that. Uh, and here we are. Uh, it's kind of crazy. The, the funny one, too, is uh, product designer, because you see it was a bit more popular in 2004, but then had a dip and kind of came back. I do wonder if, if and, and this is kind of reaching, but I do wonder if, if a product designer back then was more about physical objects. Uh, and then that sort of died down with the advance of the internet, and that has kind of come back with product development online and uh, product design. Uh, so it's it's very interesting to see how these you know titles are are being broken down, but again you know like here we're seeing these 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 these, these challenges uh, also in the WordPress space. So if if you're in WordPress today and you build websites for customers, chances are you'll have to specialize more in the future. You'll have to decide on a path, so so to speak. Some people go more into development, so that could be you know JavaScript, the front end frameworks like React, Vue, uh, on on the development side, uh, building APIs, GraphQL, whatever. Or on the other side, you could be on the product and marketing side. You can say, hey, you know, like I'm someone who's 
who's bringing all these different tools together to drive the actual you know, business outcome or values that we're looking for. Um, what, what is the business trying to achieve? And that's what I'm going to push for. Uh, but, I, but I generally feel like that one person in the middle will slowly you know, cease to exist in that regard. So where does that all leave us in the end? Well, if we come back to the beginning where I talked about the purpose of many websites back then in terms of just simply being there to exist, um, then I think that we have to understand and gain an appreciation for the purpose we serve today. You know, do we develop for the sake of developing? Do we design just to design? Do we build websites just so that there's a website online? Are these all like zero to one switches? Um, of course not. Building a website today is, is implicit, right? It's a commodity. Uh, anybody can do so by going on, on Wix or Squarespace to, to build a website. That's not hard. The, the focus in, today in that regard is, is, is still all over the place though, right? Um, many ex websites exist, but they don't deliver results. Uh, many websites have analytics, but they don't really have meaningful insights coming out of them. Uh, many websites do A-B testing, but nothing changes as a result. Um, and my favorite is, you know, many companies decide to do a full redesign, but never look at past data or lessons learned to dis determine what the new thing is that they're going to build. Um, so in, in, in this day and age, as digital becomes part of uh, everyone's lives, results and outcomes are becoming or are being talked about a lot more. And this will become increasingly important as we go into the new decade. Uh, and this also shapes you know, how you and I use and perceive WordPress. So most of the conversations I have with clients nowadays um, you know, revolve around these sort of topics. They're not necessarily about design or development or you know, a particular sort of tactical strategy. There's, there's, there's a, a, a digital has permeated all our lives. It's, it's part of all our roles. It's part of our jobs. Um, so there's this real hunger or, or, or sort of truth seeking for what is actually driving results for my website. You know, what is, what is the, what is the outcome for my brand in, in terms of long-term strategy? How am I actually getting there? Um, so, you know, as you move forward with this year, ask yourself how WordPress and you know, other tools, ideas, and experiments uh, together help drive real value for the projects you work on. And today is packed with great sessions. Uh, I've, I've looked at the schedule, it's quite amazing. There's, there's everything from new technologies, from, you know, uh, there's two Gutenberg sessions right after this, there's, there's a session on SaaS, there's a session on uh, subscriber models, there's uh, all the basics in terms of SEO, content strategy, and so on and so on. So there's really uh, a, a great sort of diversity of sessions today that help try to push you forward. Um, so I hope you'll, you'll learn a lot from it and more importantly, uh, meet a lot, a lot of new people. And in that regard, thank you. So we also have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Sorry. If anybody has any, please raise your hand and uh, somebody would come with a microphone to you. And if not, we're going to switch to our... Okay. Just a second. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, could you please go a little bit deeper into the question of pages are obsolete and we now have to start to think in blocks of content? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. So uh, just to reiterate, um, this is about pages becoming somewhat obsolete. Um, I think right now they're not. Like obviously pages exist. Um, they have a, a very important role in terms of SEO because that there's, there's a link in terms of content being archived to a certain address on the web. Um, the concept I'm talking about is, is probably more on the back end. So you'll always have a page that is generated on the front end. Uh, but when you look at marketing nowadays, um, with the advance of AI and machine learning, uh, marketing is trying to pursue personalization, right? So you go on a website or you use Spotify uh, or, or some, you know, most of you probably use Spotify to some extent. You have Discover Weekly, you have other playlists that are made for you. In that same way, pages are being made for you, right? So they, they take content from different places and say, hey, based on his behavior or her behavior, or, you know, whoever's behavior, this, this is the content we're going to show this person. 
Um, and that is the aggregation of blocks which then make up the page. So you're not designing a page necessarily, but you're designing the content and you're having a content architecture and strategy around fragments or, or, or blocks of content that are not only delivered through an API to, let's say, like a web front end, but they might also go to a watch, they might go to a phone, they might go to voice, uh, who knows what. Uh, so there's, that's, that's the, the, the sort of fragmentation in terms of we're not necessarily starting with, hey, I need you know, six pages for my website you know, in the future. That's, that's the difference I'm talking about, where it's much more content driven. Does that answer your question? Cool. Okay, any more questions? We've got a couple more minutes. All right, then applause for no talk. Oh, I and uh, I think you will be able to find him around yep. after this session cool. somewhere at the hip. Okay. Thanks so much. Go for it. <laughs>